Look, Jessica, you're nothing special. You're a horrendous human being and I can't stand the sight of you. Good chat. Let's not do it again real soon. Now, please, just go away. Robert Cephas. Excuse me. I need a seat. Living proof you can make a human being out of bile. Oh, my God. You know you're going to get your ass kicked one of these days, right? What? Carl's trying to play her today. Your boyfriend. Ugh. Carl? Oh. I thought Carl was a good guy. You thought all your guys were good guys. If you're into him, he's not a good guy. Great. So I have to be miserable for the rest of my life. <laughs> of course not. There's some guys that you ain't into. If it ain't a spark, then he's probably the guy you should be with. Go out with me. Ow! No. Why not? Because I don't like you. It's no excuse. Really, that seems like a pretty solid out to me. What the hell are you doing? Are you insane? What's going on? She just asked Robert out on a date. Your car stinks. It does now. Just drive. I want to know your angle. My angle? Beautiful girl insists on going out with a guy she despises. Gotta be an angle. Did you just accidentally call me beautiful? Mm. Yes, sir. I'm your father. I raise you as a respectable woman. Whatever's happened since you moved to Montana is going to stop. I'm not just gonna leave. I told you to date somebody that bores you. Not take some horrible jerk that's gonna treat you like crap up front. He's gotta be a jerk, right? Robert! I mean, if he's not a jerk, then he's a nice guy, and I don't wanna be around nice guys because nice guys are jerks. Don't worry. You'll be happy. You'll see. What am I missing? The whole picture? You're a beautiful girl. Don't let anybody convince you otherwise. Can you, can you roll now? I'm paying for this lane. Welcome to Fandom Forum Season 2. I'm your host, Joe Compton, and today we're going to discuss a very interesting film called The Thin Line. Uh, the film was directed by Neil Thompson and written by Eldon and Neil Thompson. It's made in 2019. This is Neil's first film, uh, first feature film, I should say. And uh, it, it, it stars uh, Neva McIntosh, Jamie Elman, and we'll, we'll talk about who all these characters are in a minute. I do have a group of people here with me who actually just saw the film and want to talk about it as well. And we'll have them introduce themselves and then we'll get to talking about The Thin Line. Hi, I am Megan Morgan. I am the author of The Altered Wake, uh, the first in a sci-fi fantasy series. And I also wrote uh, two short stories for the In the Blink of an Eye anthology, which is based on uh, the uh, the Butterfly Kisses movie by Eric Christopher Myers. Yeah, I'm Angela Breen. I'm the author of a romantic suspense series, um, The Department of Second Chances, and uh, yeah, that's it. <laughs> hey <-o. laughs> How's it going, everybody? I'm Brian Tan. I am the author of Invincible Heart, the first book in the Permutation Archives series, which is a spinoff of Kendra Souter's Permutation Archives, sci-fi thriller action, as well as the Path of Redemption series, which is a urban, I guess, urban fantasy, urban vampire action fantasy. I am also one half of the dynamic duo, well, technically 
tremendous trio of the Plotaholics with um, Shane Wilson and I. We do the uh, main long form podcast and the weekly, um, I guess, new show with our occasional third amigo, Mr. Joe Compton. <laughs> I'm honored to be considered a, a, a mainstay there. Uh, well, you're also the you're also the historian. You're the one that comes up with all the like the the facts that we can't remember, and you never miss an episode. So and, yeah. and, 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 and frustrates Shane because I keep you on air longer than he wants to be on. Air. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think I kind of do that too with my <laughs> filibustering. Oh crap! I also forgot. I'm also the co-host of Writers Uncensored with Kendra Souter. In our last episode, I literally went on a whole hour-long rant, only pausing long enough to breathe. <laughs> you know, the, uh, so I'm gonna I'm gonna step up here and, and describe this film the best way that I possibly could think of describing it. And for me, it's like um, going going on this like deep people watching exercise for like a couple days, and then taking all these people or, or taking a couple of these people and putting them in a room and putting them up against the light detector test. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, it's, it's very brash and it is very forward. And it, it, it's just, it's, it's different. I would describe it as sort of a, a riff on a romantic comedy with um, some interesting, like, little bits of relatively realistic stuff thrown in and cartoons about uh, suicidal ideations. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was, yeah. I, was thinking, I was thinking this whole time that uh, uh, we, she was pulling from Hoops McCann's portfolio. Yes, she was. <laughs> there was a very huge One Crazy Summer um influence in this one um i agree 100 percent. this is a film that i don't want to put it on the same level of view universe as far as dialogue and realism because i don't know what it's like in montana i've never <laughs> been to montana however i really enjoy the the, the, the realism of the dialogue, man. You know, there, there's a lot of writers that can't write dialogue. They can't write conversation. And none of the conversation in this film felt fake or anything. Everything felt very, very realistic. So, and this is definitely a parody of romantic comedy. It's a huge parody. It's like it takes romantic comedy and just laughs in its face. I think a parody of a romantic comedy is a good way to put it. I have so much to say about this film. And I do want to say that like it did redeem itself in the end, but I had a real hard time in the beginning with this movie. <laughs> like, <laughs> Let's talk about the two characters that are really involved in this film for the most part. I mean, you have you have Robert and Jessica, and Jessica's really the narrator of this film. She's really we're really seeing a lot of this, if not all of it, from Jessica's perspective. Um mm -hmm. I mean, even in the way that she sees Robert, uh, in, and and you know, even the scenes where she's not in, but Robert is is doing his Robert thing, it's really from Jessica's mind that we're really seeing this. In my in my in my humble opinion, uh, I I mean, I could be wrong about that, but but I do think that setting a, this this movie does a lot to set up what's to come, and and it takes a while to set up. I do agree with you on that. I think there's a lot of there's a lot of things that we have to uncover and and just you know kind of put out there before we can move forward. I have I have so many feels about Jessica and Robert. Um, so the the first scene, like the opening scene, is her dad yeah. talking down to her in such a way that I was like blown away. And then she stops everything, right? And that's part of the how they do the. Um, how they move the story forward. She stops everything and says, wait, this makes my dad sound like an asshole. And I'm like, well, cause he is. He is about a POS, uh, man. He, he is about a POS, dude. Yeah. He, her dad sucks. Yes, so much. So I knew he sucked from that point, but then she takes us back and it's like, and, and she goes into her, it's um, her first kind of, when we find out that she has suicidal thoughts and she's got the razor blade to her wrist mm -hmm. um, and she goes through her her requirements for a suicide, which is you have to be, it has to be subtle because she's a lady 
It has to be effective, effective and presentable. And she has to be presentable, yeah. And that whole thing, like, I I had a, a suicide in my family um, last fall, and that that whole thing was very hard for me because, and also having like I after I had my kids, I had um, severe postpartum and. I struggled with suicidal thoughts and I have to say that none of that affects that. But the way they used it in the film, I thought ended up being effective to show um, this story, which in story grid talk, we call it a worldview maturation mm -hmm. where she moves from seeing the world one way, which is kind of faulty to seeing it how it actually is. And they showed that really well through this kind of plot device. So the first time it came on screen, I was totally blown away. So if, if you're thinking about watching this movie, just know that ahead of time. But stick with it because it, it does redeem itself. It's definitely worth end. it's definitely worth sticking with it. I um as a kid, I actually had that moment where I didn't have a razor blade because I have a fear, I have a personal fear of razor blades. So it makes shaving kind of, you know, I had to get used to that. But I did have a moment when I was a kid and I still remember it to this day where I sat in my bedroom with a knife at my wrist and my brain is going like 500 miles an hour trying to come up with reasons to do it and then reasons not to do it. And then, so that really brought, that really helped me to sort of put myself in her shoes. And it's a powerful way to pull somebody in, you know, first you get, the asshole dad berating his daughter in a way that he wouldn't put up with any man talking to her, but he's doing it. Mm -hmm. And then you get the razor blade. It's very, it's very compelling. I'm thinking to myself, Oh my God, what am I watching? Right. You yes. know, I wasn't yes. prepared for that at all. Yes. And then we get into it and it's like, all right, that did what it was supposed to do. It hooked me. Pulls you right in. A particular device. Like, uh, very interesting in the way that it was handled. I think that, like at first, there are a lot of things about there are a lot of components of this movie because it's playing with sort of your expectations of what a romantic comedy is. Um, there are certain things that are like a little bit off putting at first, and then as the movie sort of goes, you see the reasons for those choices. And I sort of assumed that, especially like Jessica's attitude towards relationships, it seemed like they were probably like leaning pretty hard into this idea that she's looking for, you know, someone to save her. She, she, 100% of her sort of life view is invested in the idea of being in a relationship. And she'll take basically anyone, regardless of how absolutely shitty they are. And enter Robert. <laughs> yeah, well, not um, even Robert. Um, but, the boy, the but, boyfriend at the beginning. That guy's a tool. Yes, yes, he's a tool. But can we just say before we know the story with Robert, all we know about him is he's an asshole to old ladies, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he's a registered sex offender. We yes. don't know why, and I knew it was going to be what it was. I would love to see a prequel yeah. with Robert's life leading up to this because. What's funny, Sharon and I are sitting there watching this movie, and I'm every time, every scene with Robert, I'm like, I like this. This is me. Yeah. This is me. And Sharon's like, and every time, like, when Jessica is being nice to him and she's telling, you know, and she's like, wow, he sounds just like you. And I'm like, I know, I relate to him. Like, I really relate to this guy because I've been the guy that's gone to places with headphones on and a trench coat and sunglasses and put put out a demeanor that said, leave me alone. I don't want you interacting with me. Matter mm -hmm. of fact, I still do it without even realizing it. So, you know, I'm very like, I love the way we, we get enough of Robert to be compelled by him, but we don't get the full story. And I love and hate it at the same time. Yeah. Yeah. It's almost, it's almost nice, but at the same time, I I want to know more. And also, just for the record, I don't know a single little lady who wouldn't have beaten him with her cane for being an asshole in the beginning of that movie. Oh, Grandma, Grandma <laughs> Tam would have shot him. <laughs> yeah. Great. 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 Robert Cephas. 
Living fruit can make a human being out of bile. There's not a civil bone in his body. I only know his name because of his credit card. If there was an antidote to my life, he'd be the poison. He's our best customer. Excuse me. Excuse me, can I have a seat? What? I want to sit down. I need a seat. I can't hear you. I, I... Well, take your earphones out. Yeah, I can't. I can't. I'm wearing earphones. Take your earphones out. Take them out. Take the. No. I can't understand. Do you not speak? Oh my God! Good morning. <laughs> some moments when when they could have like tightened things up a little bit more in like that respect especially I think that Jessica's like suicidal ideations could have shown up not just in the little animated sequences but also there's there aren't really very many moments when she's discussing this with the people in her life this seems like something that her friends know about um, that you know, she, one of her, her roommate finds her in the bathroom with the razor to her wrist and is like, not again. Like, this is something people in her life know about and no one is talking about it. And there's this sort of interesting idea that in her relationship with Robert, she's sort of the positive one. And that's not to say that like someone who is depressed and having suicidal ideation can't be positive by any means, but you don't really see that sort of like struggle that she's having in the in the day to day, I think as much as I would like to. And then I also would have liked to have seen more of why is Robert just an unmitigated asshole? Like what caused him to be this way? I don't, I don't just want the words. I wanna know why. Got any booze at your place? You can grab a six pack and go back and chill? No. Why not? Don't want to. Oh, Jesus Christ. You don't want to go out with me either, but you had a decent time, right? There's something to do. We're, we're really feeling this through Jessica's whole perspective. It seems like everything around her has this kind of animated, like, goofiness. Like, all of the characters in, in, the, in the shop, customers that come in, they're like these stereotypical, the comic relief in her life kind of idea. And it's kind of like this interesting thing that how she perceives them. And, and like when they have real moments, like when she first asked Robert out and they're all like, what are you doing? What are you doing? You know, it's like, it's, it's like interesting how that dynamic kind of shrinks and changes too, because we're seeing the real people talking, but when we're, when she's introducing them, they're more alive and more, goofy and interesting. Well, one thing I really like about this movie is that the only person that seems to have likable like qualities and I hate the name they give her but and I, I only I remember her nickname. They they called her Heifer. Yeah. Like she she's probably the only one that really comes off to me as likable because like literally she she's doing her job, she's just chilling. And everyone shits on her. Like her cousin, who's her roommate that works with her. I mean, she sees she's getting ready to slit her wrist, and she puts her arm in a litter box because yeah. she's worried about the tile in the bathroom. And that. yeah, and the, the 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 French girl, she doesn't really seem to give a shit about anybody one way or the other. So I mean, the only person that's extremely likable and lovable in this movie of everyone is the girl heifer and even like robert who hates everyone has that one tender moment with her yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> which i thought yeah. was amazing i i can't even stand the whole heifer thing and the boss like oh, I I punch him in his friggin when he says you know get back uh, do i have to put the electric fence up constantly making cow comments and he hands her the friggin mop i would have smacked him with that so hard I, I would have kicked him 
as hard as humanly possible. Right. I don't care. I would have happily taken the. Uh, You're rooting you on in the sidelines. I would have <laughs> gladly true. taken the charge. I would have gladly taken the assault charge because that dude, and we've all worked for a boss like that. That's another reason why I love this. These characters are believable. They are real people that we have encountered. Story may be money. I usually do because I'm dying to hear how it ends. Do you know what this is? All of this? A coffee shop? That's right. It's a coffee shop built with these two hands. Built to sell coffee, not stories. So as long as Jessica works for Jose, Jose expects Jessica to show up on time and to sell coffee. Coffee, yes, good job. We've encountered the brooding asshole. We've encountered just all of these people. And I can't even, now I've never been a woman, so I never had a dude come up to me and make sexual wing. Well, I have, and that was relatively <laughs> uncomfortable. So I can only imagine how uncomfortable it is for a woman. So, I mean, all every, even the bit players, even the extras, everyone is relatable. I talk a lot about feminism whenever I talk about anything, because <laughs> it's kind of like what this is what I'm always looking for, you know, are like, what is this film doing like as far as its portrayal of females? And I think that with Jessica, we this i spent this entire movie kind of like on the edge of my seat because i was like this could go one of two ways mm. and it goes the way that i'm expecting it to go i'm going to be really mad at the end of this um and if it goes the other way then i'm going to be really pleasantly surprised because i feel like the character of jessica and sort of like the way she's coming across is um She's like, she's a little bit shallow in sort of the way she's thinking about relationships and the way she's thinking about like her position in the world. And there are a lot of romantic comedies and this is labeled as one. And there are a lot of romantic comedies where you see that kind of character. And then they get the guy in the end and that's it. And they don't really grow as a character. They sort of maintain that sort of shallowness. I feel like her shift in perspective as to how she views her relationships with men was really positive and really real. And, and I think that you are seeing a character, like I said, who is very repressed emotionally in some ways. And so it's kind of childish in some ways. And in other ways, and, and, and I don't know that you really see this a lot, but you hear other characters talking a lot about how she's really been the one who has like helped take care of her sister, which in a sort of like, kind of messed up household like this, it's very common, you know, for particularly an older sibling to kind of take on that role of parenting. And so you kind of get this feeling that she's maybe been responsible for too much in the sense that she probably didn't really have a childhood. She was probably sitting on a lot of stuff and controlling her behavior to please her father and watching out for her sister. And at the same time, she has this idea of a relationship being the end all be all because she she hasn't had a chance to develop her own sort of like wants and desires in life. And, and that was one thing that I would have liked to have seen, although I definitely appreciated that move in her relationships with sort of these like toxic men. Uh, Angela, I'm kind of curious from, from you want to talk a little bit about the story grid aspect of it. From like the first act to the second act and then kind of moving into the second act to the third act kind of. Um, well, the, the big things with this is the um, story grid genre, which is worldview maturation, um, which is kind of like a hero's journey. But instead of um, like, you know, Star Wars is a hero's journey. Instead right. of killing the Death Star, it's uh, realizing that the world is what it actually is and not how you believe it is because of um, preconceived notions or whatever. So for Jessica, it's moving from where she's letting her abusive father and his kind of bullshit color the way she sees the world and sees men in particular. Um, 
to kind of learning to stand up for herself and that she is worthy. Um, and she kind of moves beyond the whole suicide thing. Um, it's kind of that journey. My personal taste, I feel like they could have like leaned a little bit more into the comedy and like maybe kind of uh, made us a little bit more in on sort of the turn that we get at the end. Because I think that at, at some moments it maybe plays it a little bit too straight in the way it unpacks, especially um, the, the Taylor character. Uh, uh, I, like I didn't really know what to do with him within the film. And, and this is her friend who initially gives her the advice that she should date someone she's completely unattracted to. But it's it's kind of got this weird thing going on where it seems like he's really obviously into her. It seems like she's really obviously into him, but neither one of them thinks the other is. Um, and I feel like maybe, I'm not sure that he is. I think that maybe just because of sort of the romantic comedy conventions that we have going on here, that it seems that way. Taylor... The, the, he is he's the most un unbelievable character because this is the type of he for me they should have casted someone that was more in the realm of ducky from a uh, pretty in pink yeah the guy who obviously likes her that ignores him because the way they present him and the way he looks i'm a straight male and i'm thinking this dude i'm like damn if i was a female oh boy hey, yeah that's that's so interesting you say that because I I really got like when he when they first introduced him I really got like the gay friend vibe from him. So did I. Right off the bat. So did I. But th this this guy this casting is the most miscast because he's too perfect for that role. He's way too perfect for that. Yeah, I kind of think you almost end up in, and I hate to say this, but you end up in the territory of like a magical Negro kind of character. Someone who um, kind of comes in and is able to sort of like fix everyone's problems and is way more knowledgeable than any of the other characters. And it kind of leans that way even more because this is like the only African-American character that we see the entire movie. Well, um, other than the extras, he's the only one that talks. Yeah. Yes. And, and so the fact that he's the only African-American character and he's also someone who's coming in as like by far the most mature person in the movie who like sets boundaries, gives good advice, kind of has everything all together and is in general perfect. I mean, he's he's doing like art shows and stuff and is well dressed and is cute. And yeah, I think that- And uh, exercises and swims first thing. Who the hell? I don't know no brothers that are swimming before <laughs> the sun rises. I know my black ass ain't swimming before the sun rises. <laughs> Especially not in a damn lake. It is cold. Things live in there. Hell no. Brother is too perfect. And I've never been to Montana. I don't know what Montana looks like. But from what I understand, there ain't that many brothers there. So he's like the third black guy of four that live in the whole state of Montana. <laughs> What? <laughs> that is the most unbelievable thing of this movie. <laughs> Are we going to gloss over the fact of the, the bikini um, coffee shop? Oh, we kind of talked about that before you came on. Oh my anyway, god. So, <laughs> we were talking about this actually. Uh, uh, so oh, while I, I was tardy? I, <laughs> Uh, in Washington State, in the Pacific Northwest, and these were actually really common there. Um, there were a ton of these coffee shops where either um, the women were very scantily clad in bikinis or in some cases were full on topless with like tape over their nipples. Um, so uh, it's, it's a really strange thing to see on the East Coast. This is not something that you have here. Yeah, like, I live in Pittsburgh. Coast, I ain't never seen topless no, coffee bars. No, but on the West Coast, in the Pacific Northwest, this was absolutely something that I had pretty regular experience with, actually. And it's sort of considered, like, uh, like I guess- Why did anyone tell me about this? <laughs> <laughs> it's not really- Back like, your bags and move to Seattle. <laughs> 
Well, yeah, I don't just... know that it's really considered like like sexual so much as it's just a weird quirk thing of the Pacific Northwest. 